Welcome back to The Edge, episode 333. Well, this is going to be a show. Have you seen the article by the Wall Street Journal about Google algorithms? Twitter's on fire with SEOs coming to the defense of, Google's def uh, defense of Google. And users are wondering what data is for sale. Be sure to check out the news, this bonus episode, for more about this story. But for now, we're going to be talking about this article and, uh, and, and his reaction with the, f with the father of SEO. Bruce Clay today on the edge. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here at see more at edge of the web radio.com. Now, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Oh, so this is Edge of the Web Radio episode. 333. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. Every week we bring you amazing industry guests to chat about di trending digital marketing topics and marketing news. Uh, we unpack topics uh, for for the, our digital market marketing audience. Be sure to check all the recent shows over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. We're cranking out podcasts, video casts, blog content, social, all in the in the space to be able to, to give you as much content as possible as we talk to some fantastic marketing influencers from around the planet. If you want to deep dive into each and every show, we have a news podcast as well as our uh, our interview podcast. So check that out. Um, I'd like to introduce our producer in the studio who's just unmuted his mic. That's Jacob Mann. Yeah, you're, now you're watching me do it. <laughs> and on my periphery, I see I'll jump. I got to jump quicker. <laughs> Jacob, how you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Excellent, excellent. Uh, appreciate the cut. The cut. You got a good a new haircut there, man. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we were at a conference last weekend, so had to make sure I looked nice. I was presenting, did a little bit of talk about SEO stuff. Yes, and, you did. Uh, yeah, it went really well. Very so, cool. Very cool. They, they yeah, we had a, had a few good points come out of the office. And yep. uh, did you shock and awe them? Um, did you I scare so, them? Did you I, scare them? I think I scared them, but that was the photos I was putting up. So <laughs> I had a picture of me on the beach in a a donut. Uh, um, like a what the the floaty yeah 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 just flexing I made that as part of my presentation because why not huh well and you were representing us at the time that's well, you fantastic know. hey it made them laugh and it made them pay attention so it's all good <laughs> all right hey some edge notes some housekeeping we want to uh, cover real quick um, we're really geared towards SEO we've been doing this for the last quarter of the year uh, our episodes have been focused more and more and we had a great interview with Andy Drinkwater when we unpacked the 209 point aud SEO audit checklist well we're really excited about what we did with that interview so we swung around and we want to bring our live Live SEO audit to your YouTube channel. I mean, you got to subscribe to this and be able to jump in and, and, and watch what we're going to be doing here. We've had a couple bobbles, uh, well, not bobbles, and he's been sick, and we want to make sure that he is up to his his uh, utmost of SEO proficiency whenever we go live. So next next Wednesday, the twenty seventh, right? Is it next Wednesday? Not next Wednesday. Yeah, it's next Wednesday at the 27th yeah. at noon. I have everybody good. actually shaking their heads in there, but I read the bloody thing. All right, so. 27th it is. 27th at noon. We're going to go live, auditing a, a site live. And uh, we're going to be able to unpack it, use all of our different tools. You're going to have a great experience. I guarantee it. What could go wrong there, right? So check it out. And make sure you set a reminder, either uh, ring the bell, you know, smash the bell, as they would say. Oh, boy, I sound like an old fogey. <laughs> uh, smash that bell. Get a reminder whenever the whenever uh, uh, we go live and hey do some lunch have some SEO audit time with us want to know also want to let you know who's coming up on the show Kim Scott's returning to the show uh, next week if I'm not mistaken uh, Elizabeth Mar Martson is also joining us on December 2nd Talia Wolf is coming on uh, December 9th and Robert Rose is joining us at the end of the year uh, December 16th and uh, you again you want to make sure that you uh, get reminded of those live shows all right so we're gonna we're gonna welcome you to the Cytrategics Digital Marketing News Desk. This bonus newscast uh, podcast is is for our digital marketing consumers, and it's tied to our regular podcast uh, of interviews. So I'm your host, Aaron Sparks, and joining me today for the news podcast is Bruce Clay. Bruce, how you doing, sir? 
I'm doing great. Thank you. You're, you're more than welcome. Glad to have you on board. I'll tell you what, I've been a huge fan over the years of what Bruce Clay, uh, the, your namesake uh, uh, services and your company out there have been doing for SEO. And we really want to unpack your history and, and what you've seen over the course of years. But we also have a, a slew of uh, uh, news items that we want to go over with you. So you're ready to take a swing at these. Sure, I'm okay. ready. All right. So let's take a look at our first article. Hey, you want to hear some great news? Ba -ba -da -ba, ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. This week's trending topics. All right, so uh, we always like to talk about patents on our show, especially when it comes down to Google patents. And you know, uh, I, I think we're we're watching that more and more when we since we've had Bill Slosky on the show a couple of times uh, from Search Engine Journal from Dave Davies. A patent Google is going old school with local SEO, but in a new way. The system is actually intended to monitor user behavior and combine said behavior with their location within a store, send them information that may support their purchase decision. And, failing that, provide access to remote assistance and, should that fall short as well, send a signal to the store that a user is in need of information and dispatch a sales associate to their location. Holy Hannah, that's a plan of attack there. <laughs> so, we watch patents on a regular basis here. This one got, got uh, uh, submitted here just recently. It's called the Automatic Delivery of Customer Assistance at a Physical Location. And there's a number of entries uh, in this patent outline, but the abstract is just that is if, if a consumer is actually showing intent, if they can't get to the store, if they have a purchase decision, there's a system that is going to be planned, and this is the patent submission, to be able to alert the customer, or I'm sorry, the shop owner, to be able to ultimately get a sales associate to them to help them in their purchase. Bruce, this is kind of bridging the gap of, of digital consumer intent to physical consumer intent to the degree of even alerting somebody. I mean, can you think of a better way that small businesses can capitalize on, on th what that consumer's behavior is online? Well, I think that the biggest thing, well, Bill, I'm sure said this, uh, there's a lot of patents that are never implemented. Yep. And obviously, as you go through this particular case, there is a codependency on the shop owner actually paying attention and, and receiving notification identifying which shopper in that aisle or, or in the store might be the right one. Yeah. If it is a small enough business, you might be fortunate enough that there's like one person in the store. Maybe. <laughs> then right? we know, you know so, exactly who it is. So you know exactly who it is. Uh, I don't really think this is a program that's going to work well at Costco during the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the notification process is really the second part of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that the only way this would really work is if the store opted into it. Right. And that would probably actually manifest itself as some form of pay-per-click opportunity for Google. It, we all, it all always comes back there, right? <laughs> we all understand Google's in the business of making money, and they should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is an opportunity for them to make money to facilitate sales for the end user offline. Right, right. And it's an online notification. I think it's a, a logical thing for people to want to do. I just think that the implementation is going to be somewhat chaotic and uh, perhaps not work well. Mm -hmm. uh, if during the holidays you've ever walked into an Apple store, I mean, you're lucky you end up on a list and they tell you to go sit down for a half hour <laughs> and, and then they come and find you. But it's Apple. Like, so you're, but you're, so you're, so you're happy, happy to wait because you're among, amongst your ilk, right? So how is this much different from that? Well, I mean, yeah, there's so I, many underpinnings that have to get this right. You have to be, your device has to be communicating. Uh, that's the, the first thing is that you have to be broadcasting your signal. They also rely on different tiers of, of notification as well as um, even beacon technology. All of those tumblers have to be into place just to even get an alert, let alone be able to find that person. You're absolutely, the, the, the practicality of this is a little bit more of a conjecture than, than a reality, right? But even then, 
uh, part of this is it could uh, guide you towards supplemental type products. Mm -hmm. And that requires a whole lot of uh, personalization. Yeah. And that goes into privacy statements. And is that going to work? Are, is somebody allowed to know what your preferences are? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we're going to run into all sorts of legal issues, I think, ultimately with this kind of an implementation. But I think that goes back to the fact that most patents are never implemented. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and privacy was the biggest concern of this article. Um, but it's interesting to see, usually the patent submissions are a piece of a larger context. And that, again, that's what, that, what Bill Slosky does on a regular basis, trying to put together the, the, uh, the quilt that is being woven by Google. In this respect, this patent has a lot of, uh, of completedness from these concepts, as opposed to spread out in, in multiple patent submissions. It was, and again, not looking at the entire patent submission, I'm taking the article at face value, but it is a very well broken down uh, picture of kind of an ecosystem that has to be in place for it to work. And uh, you're absolutely right, the, the reality of that um, being embraced and oh my gosh, what, what things could go wrong <laughs> in that process? It's, it's a scary proposition, but I mean, who knows if, if it actually does come and get and gets uh, tested out in a particular region of the country, uh, you better believe it, uh, there's going to be a, a hovering Google support to make sure that it's as, as effective as possible. What do you think? I think. Uh, it's going to be difficult for it to be implemented. Yeah. I mean, I think the average store might have one or two salesmen, mm -hmm. and they wait for people to ask them questions. But if it's going to be proactive, and they're going to go, engage the customer, uh, I, I don't know that all customers are ready for that. No, no because if you're in there on a private, you know, with your private data, even if you're searching online and you send that signal, you're still not asking to be communicated to, right? <laughs> I, I, one of the big things about digital was that you didn't have a salesman in your face. That's right. So. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine. All, all the digital signals, your footprint, your footprint arrives before you do because you literally mapped your way to the store and they're waiting for you at the door. Well, I could imagine that you went to this store, that store, and then the final store, and they would understand, much like web history, they would understand that that was your prior search behavior, mm -hmm. even though it was visitation behavior, and then use that to guide what the store will try to sell you. Uh, we're going to breed creepy, creepy sales stalkers. It sounds like Minority Report <laughs> when he gets those, when he gets his eyeballs changed and he's yep. walking through the store and it's it's you know identifying the wrong guy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What could go wrong with that? All right. Um, next article from The Verge from McKenna Kelly and Julia a uh, Alexander uh, Culpa. Uh, YouTube's new kids content system has. As content creators scrambling on Tuesday afternoon, YouTube formally announced its plan to have creator labels, uh, creators label any videos of theirs that may appeal to children. Starting in January 2020, if creators mark a video as directed at kids, data collection will be blocked for all viewers, resulting in lower ad revenue, and those videos will lose some of the platform's most popular features, including comments and end screens. It's a major change on how YouTube works and has left a lot of creators clueless as to whether they're subject to the new rules. So uh, there was a, 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 this is COPA, this is Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which forbids data collection from children under the age of 13 without expl explicit consent of the parents. In the case, this ruling means that YouTube cannot employ its powerful ad targeting engine uh, on anyone that might be under the age of 13. So a huge amount of lo uh, uh, revenue loss for that, that kid targeting, but it's in compliance with the law. So creators are actually being held responsible now by the FTC. Um, Bruce, what do you think about, about uh, this additional clampdown on data collection as it applies to uh, content for kids? Well, I'm not positive that the kids actually were a lot of revenue for people. Uh, perhaps if they were making their Christmas list, but that doesn't really need to know about their prior search history. Yep. I think that uh, privacy, it has its place, and I think that it's a wonderful thing for people to 
uh, respect the need to have the children not be exploited. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that that's going to impact a lot of the revenue because even toy stores sell to parents. Yeah. No. And I don't think that's going to, for years, nobody tracked anybody. And it still worked. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, well, there's actually even even more dire consequences. Uh, if you're not labeling, labeling a video as child-directed, you could actually uh, suffer some severe penalties. The FTC made it clear that it could sue individual channel owners who abuse this new labeling system. So um, those lawsuits will fall entirely on the channel owner's plate, not YouTube itself. So YouTube's complying and these 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 content creators have to fall in line um you're absolutely right is where where was that revenue on the child side of things um there's a heck of a lot in I, I inside was, of uh, i mean for pootie pie for example right this, so i was gonna say i don't i don't think it's gonna affect the revenue of anyone who's like like a toy store sure but i could see this affecting the revenue of the content creators who may have found that these uh child themed uh you know shows or whatever get them a lot of views and if previously they were just collecting you know number of views yeah and you know well pootie pie and if you're not familiar with him uh, he is the leading youtuber the leading tuber, youtuber online and he's literally pulling in between sixty five thousand to 1.2 million a month off of his YouTube channel, and it's a it's a gaming channel where he's literally playing games that absolutely attract the younger I, audience. I right? gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he's he's racking up two million new view new new viewers each and every month, which is crazy. But that is revenue right there, and it's directed to kids because I I literally see my kids watching his videos, which now, is. The, the one thing I didn't see is, is, is this saying kids are anyone under 18 or under, 13, under 13? Under 13. Under 13. Right. So I've already started seeing on our YouTube videos, I have to uh, say for each one if it was designed for kids or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying we're not because I don't think there's a lot of under 13-year-olds getting into the uh, SEO world. But, um, I, I mean, I would guess someone like him, he can just start saying, no, it's not designed for kids. Mm -hmm. And then the kids that are under 13 that really want to see it will beg mom and dad and they'll get to see it anyway and he will be fine. Yep, I really and do. That's I, how I think he would absolutely. handle it. Absolutely. I really do think that these gamer YouTubers are going to suffer the, the biggest loss um, in that space. They just won't have these additional uh, features and functions uh, because their audience is, uh, are these 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 younger audiences. Trust me, I mean, I got a, I got a couple that are, are constantly consuming that video content. And on top of that, uh, there's a note, uh, correction on the uh, article, uh, creators won't be a able to appeal YouTube's decision about whether their videos are directed or kids under the new policy. Uh, uh, added that uh, the new system will actually be rolling out in 2020. So YouTube is literally going to categorize your content for you if you don't do it yourself. That's a, that's a heavy, heavy hit. It is. I, I think the article said that you can't appeal it, but you can provide feedback. <laughs> All right. Well, I think. <laughs> go ahead. I think one of the questions that you're going to run into is how does YouTube make money? Because you're asking them to self police mm -hmm. whether or not there could be tracking and therefore advertising advantage on some of these videos. Right. And they're going to determine that themselves. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're always going to uh, err on the side of this is for children. Correct. I mean, who's watching The Watchmen, so to speak, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right, is that they're, they're still in it to make money. And uh, um, there it, it will be very interesting to see how this actually rolls out. Um, well, let's flip it over. I think it would be wonderful if every single video on YouTube suddenly said it's for children. <laughs> because then, effectively, YouTube has no revenue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <They'll> <laughs> That's <change> funny. It. <laughs> it's all kid-friendly. It's for kids. I might have to change the theme song for the show. <laughs> the Barney theme or something like that, see how it all rolls. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Is that, I mean, I get it. I get that. I mean, obviously, YouTube is owned by Google, owned by Alphabet. They are trying to comply with 
FTC regulations, and I mean, this is this is not their bailiwick. This is this is from the feds, and and we want to protect our children, and this is how it plays out. But to, yes. to lose a lot of revenue along the way, man, that's 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 a tough bite. And the, I think, as if I read it correctly, the self policing thing is part of YouTube's agreement with the government of don't sue us if this isn't right. We're going to give everyone the opportunity to self police, right. and then when you find a violation, it's not YouTube's fault. Yep. Go after them. Yep. Absolutely. All right. If you want to know who else is giving feedback on our last last article, we uh, want to reference uh, kind of a, a, a tie into our show today um, from Search Engine Land by Barry Swartz. Misquoted and misunderstood why many in the search community don't believe the Wall Street Journal about Google search. Uh, Barry's reaction uh, to the Wall Street Journal, how Google interferes with search algorithms and, and changes your results. Uh, there's a huge article out there, and we're going to unpack that today. But the... Uh, the quick the quick rundown here is that uh, the 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 article itself uh, was was a 23 page article and uh, Barry actually broke down a response to a number of key factors uh, that, that that they reference and some of that just being uh, just understanding how search works. Um, there's there's a lot of of uh, direct challenges to even the the precepts of this article, the the, the methodology, the the, the the testing sample that they did, as well as a key understanding of what blacklists blacklists are, and algorithm tweaks, what, what how algorithms actually work. So. Not only was this a really good article, and again, we'll, we'll reference this in our show uh, in a little bit deeper way, but on top of that was a great uh, roundtable, search engine roundtable article from Barry that also reflected the SEO's uh, communication in there. So some top SEO's uh, pointing out explicitly G uh, Glenn Gabe, who actually was quoted in that article and misquoted and never having a retraction from the Wall Street Journal, he literally referenced uh, Google's algorithm as a black box that you can't look into. And they literally took that and <laughs> created his quote as being black magic as it applies to Google algorithm changes. And, and uh, all this was actually off record. So you had Glenn Gabe, you had Bill Slosky out there, Marie Haynes got interviewed several times, and it seemed that they just didn't understand um, a good deal of uh, the, the key concepts of SEO. So but f without further ado, I want to let Bruce comment on some of the, what he saw in the, in the social channels of these SEOs kind of uh, uh, running around with their hair on fire a bit. What do you think, sir? Well, let's back up. Uh, we all understand Google's in the business of making money. Yes, sir. And that the organic portion of their search results doesn't really generate run any kind of cash, any money. Uh, it just attracts people to their website. And then it's the job of the website to capture money. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to, to put that. So when you're doing that, managing the organic side is strictly one of developing a trustworthy set of results. Unfortunately, being in the software business as well, I understand that the first time you release any kind of product, it isn't flawless. Nope. This product is not going to just automatically all by itself, just run and everybody's going to be happy with it. Uh, so there's a large industry out there that claims, I guess is the right word, mm -hmm. uh, that they help people by finding holes in the Google algorithm, the black hats of the world. Right. And that there is a constant battle between what's referred to as white hat and black hat, where these are groups of people who are trying to exploit the algorithm so that they can get more traffic, make more money. And Google is fighting that. Uh, if Google couldn't fight it, then ultimately the first page of Google results will go to whoever can afford the most spam. And that is not what the world wants. We need trusted sources. And spammers are historically not trusted sources. No, absolutely So not. a big part, I think, of the article uh, didn't understand that there is a dynamic environment here. Th they're assuming that because Google has all this money and it's the Google search engine, that the search engine is perfect and you never have to tweak it. 
you never have to make an adjustment to it. Yep. Uh, when somebody spams, you have a choice. I can take weeks to months to f- catch it with software, or I can just go in and suppress it. And to me, the right thing for the consumer is to suppress it. And that is, you know, I took them out. I manually suppressed that particular bad behavior within my own search engine. Now, the other thing that people forget is that being in Google is a privilege, not a right. (laughs) And that it's Google's search engine. It's not ours. And while Google has some Federal Trade Commission guidelines that they're going to have to follow, uh, especially for, you know, public trust information. Yep. They also have an obligation to us as the consumers of that to present trusted information. And if it's not trusted, I think Google has every right in the world to say, we don't trust this. We're taking it out. It's their index. It's their right. They're paying for all of us being there. Uh, And quite frankly, from an SEO point of view, it is my opinion that if it wasn't for Google, most of the SEO industry wouldn't exist. (laughs) <laughs> Amen to that. So to the, to the degree of the article, he had a lot of contribution back commenting on, on that from well-known SEOs. So I, I really do think that uh, Barry Schwartz did a fantastic job uh, breaking apart uh, and really kind of not countering, but really opening up uh, the, the table of discussion, just like you did here, Bruce. And we certainly want to uh, channel this into our show. Uh, the, 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 the last point, I guess, is... Um, we have a responsibility as SEOs for an education. And there were some good comments in the social, social stream about you know, how we got to educate journalists and politicians. So there's, there's, a, there's a lack of knowledge in, in that space. And it's shows like this that are, are, are aimed to be able to demystify and, and debunk and educate uh, those spaces. So uh, we're certainly going to gear up into that topic here a little bit later. We want to take a quick break. Um, if you're actually, uh, if, if you're getting all the traffic that you, that you want, you, you can certainly uh, uh, not look at this. But hey, for H- Ahrefs as a, as a continued sponsor of the show, we certainly want to to provide you uh, some great uh, great information about their service. Uh, you can look at top features like um, understanding uh, your competitors' top pages and what keywords rank for them, as well as the type of traffic they're getting. So it's a great analysis tool to be able to deconstruct your competitors' SEO and use it against them. Uh, you know, in all positivity and you know, clean competitiveness. So check out ahrefs.com. That's a h r e f s.com and sign up today for a free uh, trial. Uh, you're going to swim in great data. Uh, we love the tool here at the shop. We really really do. We look at it literally daily. So check them out. We uh, certainly appreciate them as a continued sponsor of Edge of the Web. All right. So Without further ado, let's welcome, welcome you back to the show. Again, I'm Aaron Sparks, and this is Edge of the Web Radio. This is episode 333, and every week we're bringing you amazing information and, and top industry guests as it applies to trending in digital marketing topics. So uh, we went through our news. If you missed our news podcast, you certainly want to jump in there and download that for all of our iTunes listeners. But uh, right now, let's take a deep dive with trending topics with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Bruce Clay, president of Bruce Clay Incorporated. All right, so we have the deep voice guy introducing Bruce Clay. Uh, we're we're honored to be able to have Bruce on our show. It's been a long time one of mine to be able to talk to Bruce. He's the SEO SEO expert, the father of SEO, so to speak, and a lot of a lot of references. Bruce Clay is the founder and president of Bruce Clay Inc., a global search marketing optimization firm uh, providing SEO, PPC, uh, social media marketing content creation, and SEO tools. Just want to make sure you got an asterisk there. Uh, and education. The company has locations all over the world, including USA, Australia, Japan, India, Switzerland, and Dubai. Bruce is known as the father of SEO. He speaks at leading industry conferences. He spe- spoken, has spoken over 300 times in these conferences and conducts a lot of training courses for students worldwide. He's been featured in various publications as the Wall Street Journal. Aha. Uh-huh. USA Today, PC Week, <laughs> many more. So, uh, Bruce, again, welcome to the show, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. So, so Bruce, uh, I like there's your your bio, your official bio, but I really want to hear from you. How in the world did you get into SEO when you did? Well, uh, you got to remember, I started back in January of 1996, mm -hmm. and uh, for those of you who can remember that far back, that's when Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> In, in his lockbox, huh? Yeah. <laughs> somebody said maybe it would catch on. Yep. And um, I had decided I wanted to try to switch into a consulting business. I hadn't really done it. I'd always had jobs, uh, even though they were pretty high powered jobs. I wanted to try consulting. Mm -hmm. And I thought this internet thing uh, would be about like that, that I would have the ability to work out of my home, uh, notebook, computer, Corona, and a beach, you know, work where I want, when I want, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, my background is I have a bachelor's in math and computer science and an MBA, marketing, programming, and along comes the internet. And Search engines are, of course, software. Mm -hmm. They're algorithms. So I went out and said, okay, I could fix this. I could solve it. I can find out what that software is actually looking for and make it right. And it took like a week to figure it out. <laughs> well, remember, I started three years before Google. Yep, absolutely. And so, yeah, you were optimizing towards AltaVista and and Yahoo for that particular direction. Alta... Alta Vista, Excite, InfoSeek. Oh, InfoSeek. Yahoo is still a directory. Right. <laughs> Back in the day. Yep. <clears throat> so we went out, and when I say we, I mean, it was me when I started this thing. I created uh, a little website, and I got optimized, and suddenly people started calling me. And so, okay, and I hired two people. And then more people called me, so I raised my price. And then more people called me and I hired two more people and had to move out of the house. <laughs> I mean, it was literally like that. And I found space and uh, it kept growing and growing and growing. And uh, then along comes Google. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, that was somewhat disruptive, but equally, it promoted SEO. And it really was a catalyst for a lot of growth. Uh, back then, uh, the conferences were just starting. Right. Search Engine Strategies was one of the bigger ones. And uh, it was interesting enough, back then, Danny Sullivan pulled all of the top SEOs together to speak at his conference. And all six of us sat as one round table in the bar. <laughs> and, you know, it's the kind of thing that if there was an earthquake, the entire industry would have been wiped out. <laughs> so... Uh, and that's what it was like when it started. And it was, quite frankly, it was, uh, compared to today, horribly okay. primitive. It it's almost like, like you are on a foreign planet, yeah, uh, like astronauts, so to speak, as opposed, as opposed to Wild West. Wild West was the, the 2000s, but literally that was almost like you were in a, for, uh, a foreign land, right? Yeah. Uh, literally, I could add a couple keywords, put it in the title, put it in the description, Yep. Submit it, and Dang. two minutes later, you're at the top of the first page. Oh, if it was only so easy. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you, the, when it started, it was that. But the thing that flipped it over and helped us all, the entire industry as agencies, uh, was that not a single client understood it. Right. Right? And so a lot of the initial growth was really... I could hire somebody and train them to do it. And in three months, maybe six at the outside, my employee knew more than all of the clients because mm -hmm. the clients didn't know what they were doing. So we were finding ourselves very early on as being where they had to go to be able to compete. And that really drove the industry in the early days. That really, really was compelling. Uh, then fast forward 10 years and the conferences have been training people. I have training courses of my own. Mm -hmm. uh, tools are starting to show up on the market and people start thinking that they know how to do SEO. 
well, after five years of doing SEO, perhaps maybe a couple, uh, they're going to know more than anybody I could hire in six months. So it became a problem for agencies where you either had to find a client that knew nothing mm -hmm. or you had to develop a senior staff. And I think that's where we see the actual fracturing to some degree of our industry. There are a lot of experts out there that I respect mm -hmm. that you've interviewed that know what they're doing in SEO. Mm -hmm. But if you compare it to the total population of the people claiming to be SEOs, it's a fraction of a percent. And like in my case, uh, I decided that the only way for me to compete is to have an entire company where every consultant had 10 plus years experience. There you go. You know, 16 plus is our average. And so I decided to go top shelf. And as soon as that happened, I limited my growth, mm -hmm. but it also moved me into the category of servicing larger clients. Right. Enterprise level SEO. Then we ran into a problem. <laughs> I'm giving you the whole story here. No, that's all right. Uh, Keep on going. Then we ran into a problem where even the enterprises had their own teams in house. Yep. Right. So they weren't really motivated to hire an agency. The only reason they would is if they didn't have the resources. And so or, we then ended or perhaps up, that they failed in what their execution was. Then you have some begrudgingly uh, 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 colleagues that uh, would not really want to have your input, uh, so to speak. Uh, so anyway, sorry, not to put words in your mouth, but yeah, <laughs> if you're brought in, you're doing surgery on something that somebody screwed up on. Correct. <laughs> That's exactly it. Uh, today, uh, probably most of the people that come to us, we're their like third or fourth SEO company. Yep. Got it. You know, they stumble, they fall, they try it again. Then they decided they're just not going to do it again. It's too costly. No, I understand. Uh, quick note, if I could, just let, let to know, I uh, want to remind our iTunes subscribers to rate this show and, and, and let us know what you think about this as we have interviews like Bruce and, and other uh, marketers that are top shelf marketers to, to Bruce's point. We want to make sure that we get the word out about you know, what we're doing in this, in this industry and, and how important it is to pay attention and educate yourself to be that, that, that senior staff that Bruce is talking about. So make sure you rate and review if you could. Sorry for the gratuitous plug, Bruce, but go ahead. No, give me more. <laughs> All right. So, hey, your time in your industry, <laughs> uh, you were one of the earliest pioneers. Um, let's talk about the efforts that you've seen in, imp in the improvement of search results. All right. Um, there's there's something. I mean, and, and we're going to unpack this to a greater degree here. But we've seen. I mean, we mentioned just briefly all of the old search engines that didn't make the cut. Right. There were so many that are gone. And Lycos, for example. Right. All. <laughs> I'm just rolling, going through my rolodex of all these search engines, and and, and uh, it, you know, that's a natural evolution of any particular product. Is the you know, if you don't have the the stamina, you don't have the particular talent, you're going to to disappear into the ether. But what do what have you seen over the last two decades that are monumental shifts uh, in in how we search? Well, so I'll go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. The how we search part, it used to be that somebody would put in a query and they would actually go down maybe five pages. Hmm. And if they didn't find what they want, they switched to a different search engine because they believed that they knew what they wanted and the search engine just didn't have the answer. Oh, wow. In today's world, people will do a search. And if the top of the page above the fold in the Google search results does not address their particular query, mm -hmm. they actually change the query. That's a huge uh, change right there. Right. So a good example is uh, we had a case where for the word cars, our client was number one, they fell to number two, but almost all their traffic disappeared. And the reason was the entire top of the page was a Walt Disney movie. Right. Right. Yep, absolutely. So people would search for cars 
they would see a Walt Disney movie, that would be the entire top of the page. So instead of drilling down to the car sites, they would just go change the query. Huh, that's, that's very interesting because the real estate changed because the intent of the entire consumer audience was bifurcated, basically. They split because some of the intent was looking for that movie, right? Right. Now, but, Google has also implemented uh, two other or three other things, I think, that actually impact that. One is uh, query deserves diversity. Mm -hmm. It used to be if you search for something, Google would take the most likely answer and give that to you. But in some cases, there's too many answers. For instance, uh, where I'm at in California, if you search for hammer, the number one result is the Armand Hammer Art Museum. Hmm. Number two result is a vitamin. Mm -hmm. Number three result is MC Hammer. <laughs> now, normally, uh, I would say that's not a hammer, uh, but that's, so, that's relative to me. But in Google's world, there are too many hammers. There's pianos have hammers and guns have hammers and museums. And so diversity is their response. So they give you a little bit of everything. And that has totally changed from the early days where uh, whatever had the most keywords on it won. Right. And so that's a big change. I think that the second thing that's a big change actually is rank brain. With rank brain, it attempts to figure out what the intent of the query is, whether it is transactional or like shopping right. or informational or even navigational. Correct. How right. do I find or things like that? Uh, and the results actually get biased. Uh, people who used to rank very, very well for a, a particular keyword, but they were a shopping site, mm -hmm. suddenly vanished. And they didn't vanish because their SEO was worse. They vanished because Google thought that the intent of that head term was informational. So the transactional site got pushed down. Exactly, and that's right there what I wanted to really unpack. Um, it's the, inf the, the perspective of loss. Google is constantly changing how it understands intent. And it's not a perfect engine, obviously. And it gets things wrong, wrong as it's actually understanding and putting together the science behind intent uh, understanding and, 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 and content evaluation for that intent. So they have a tough job because the consumer is constantly moving. We have a moving target on the consumer and their savviness of how to actually search, which is also a, a complete uh, what do you want? A, 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 a connection to the engine itself and how trustworthy the search engine is. But they also are building a model kind of in flight in the airplane of, of how to how to actually infer these things. And BERT, the, the uh, recent algorithm just came out of literally the, the transformers, understanding the linkage between uh, different terms based on the intent words like to and not and and these type of factors they're getting better and better at understanding them so the but ahead. i think i think that one of the things that we have to recognize just in general at least this is my observation is it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if rank brain thinks that everybody wants information sites so they present information sites right by definition everybody wants information sites because that's all you can click on so there, there is an issue where uh, ultimately the search engine isn't going to be able to represent uh, the fringe, if you will. Hopefully not lunatic fringe, but <laughs> the fringe. And that some of the sites that actually might appeal to that query, it is possible that they will never appear for that query. Right. And that, I think, is a particular problem that we have to pay attention to. All right. So you've teed it up to me. 
uh, strong enough to be able to dive into the Wall Street Journal article. So let me uh, introduce uh, to our, our, our listeners and our, and our audience who have not come across it. Uh, Wall Street Journal article was actually uh, uh, published November 15th by Kirsten Grind, Sam Sch- uh, Schechner, and Robert McMillan and John West. All right. So the, the article was How Google Interferes with Its Search Algorithms and Changes Your Results. And the sub headline was The Internet Giant Uses Black blacklists, algorithm tweaks, and an army of contractors to shape what you see. So this article raised ire from a bunch of SEOs in the industry. We talked about that here earlier. And uh, the, the, the assertion is that this article was poorly researched and even to the degree that it was embarrassing on a on behalf of uh, Wall Street Journal. So it's a sizable article, 23 pages like I said. But um, as we're talking about this type of echo chamber and this perspective of of ranking and loss of ranking because SEOs are constantly looking at rank performance. We're dealing with a moving target where the engine itself is trying to understand intent. There's a huge perspective and those fringe elements potentially who are who are making assertions that this has this this engine has or the company has an agenda Are we really talking about how people are looking at their own results, almost like a reflection based on a a fluid mirror? Well, I have a very strong opinion about the article in general. Yeah, give us your take. Uh, I think that news sources look for some form of sensationalism in and of itself. I think that there's a lot of ways that you can spin any number of things. And I found myself going through the article paragraph by paragraph right. and saying, well, I understand what really happens. This is just spun. Absolutely. Right? And I'll give a good example of a possible spin, not even on the article, but uh, if you and I were in a race and you won, what I could say is I came in second and you came in next to last. <laughs> absolutely right and i'd be right that's all about but uh, yeah but the implication is i beat you right and in this particular case having an army of quality reviewers that have their core mission to improve the overall quality of search results is hardly what i would call under the table black hat action and to, they, yeah, they ascribed them to be low paid contractors that also were not being listened to by Google. I mean, yeah, you better believe that was a spin. Go ahead. Yeah, well, okay. So everybody working for the ASPCA is obviously a low paid volunteer. Therefore, they're terrible people. Um, <laughs> so when you look at what's actually going on, I think that there's a large infrastructure required in order to improve quality. Yep. I think that trust and quality is the number one battle throughout Google today. And I know a lot of people have talked about expertise, authority, trust, uh, and trust is a particular item. But for the last year and a half, Google has finally been able to figure out with artificial intelligence whether sentiment is positive or negative, Mm -hmm. whether people actually are supportive of you or whether they hate you. And up until like the last year, August of last year, Google hasn't had the power to do that. Now they're getting it debugged. And I'm expecting that what we're gonna see is a great amount of leap forward in presenting proper results. For instance, Mm -hmm. if I were to walk up to my phone and ask it a question and it gave me an answer and that answer was wrong, and it was not trusted mm-hmm. just because it ranked who loses i would lose google would lose right everybody would be harmed uh confidence would drop but if google finds that this is a spammer and i am not going to let it be number one and i am going to intervene until we develop the software to catch it mm-hmm. i think that's totally within google's realm but the way it was written was, oh, somebody was caught, they were taken out, they fixed it, they went back in, and that's evil. Right. And I'm not positive that's the case. It is just perspective, and to the degree, you'd want somebody working on your behalf to do just that. 
and and Google's trying to continually build trust of that consumer. You know, something you just mentioned something and it dawned on me is that consumers have a level of expectation ab absolutely, but they also, I mean, there's a perfect t case study uh, of of how how people are allowing for a a software to mature and that's the that's the in-home uh, smart speaker is that how many times do we get a bad result back and and accept it as all right well it, it's just not there yet from from a, from understanding exactly what i'm asking for so voice search is by its very nature d demonstrating that consumers are are letting it incubate. They know that this thing is going to evolve into a much better technology. But it's but it's but it's trying to get smarter. It's trying to develop. So we're in full acceptance that that's happening, and, and the same thing applies. But we're just further down the road with Google, and that that process happened. It had to get smarter, and along the way, there's so many inferences in this article that that again, with one perspective, it could certainly be spun that way. For example, eBay was a reference in that uh, losing uh, substantial rankings over time. Well, guess what? There's a lot of different algorithm changes that every site was exposed to, and a lot of big sites besides eBay also dropped. Breitbart uh, released a video uh, uh, about execs of Google upset about the Trump win, and they said that they get, got it buried on page 12, but then as soon as they complained about it, and in internal Google Googlers complained about it, it ra rose to the top. And as well as Deal, Deal Catcher, another example of a company that lost 90% of its traffic, but then got it back. All these things are perspectives from those, those individual companies. You got to prove the data. You got to be able to prove your case, not just sit from one angle and say, you know, this hurt me. Therefore, you must be doing something bad. Sorry, I was on a rant there. Go ahead, Bruce. <laughs> well, I'll I'll go back to a old example. Uh, at one point, BMW got caught uh, keyword stuffing uh, their pages, hmm. and Google took them out of the index. But like a day or so later. Google put them back in the index, but just for the word BMW, because it was a bad user experience mm -hmm. to search for BMW and not find it. So if eBay came back, it may be that it only came back for branded terms. I don't know that, but it would be a bad experience to search for a brand and not find the brand. Right. And, uh, and I believe that Google in general uh, has never ever expressed any caring about whether you rank organically or not. Their algorithm doesn't care because they make no money on organic. And I don't think they take people out just to hear complaints. Right. I think they take people out because there's a good reason to have them come out. And, it, and that would be a manual action. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it is the algorithm. But I'm a programmer. Uh, I've been programming for years and I know every once in a while you make a mistake. Sure. You know, you, you use a not instead of the positive. Oh, right, right, right. You know, you, you don't do it quite the same way. And every once in a while, something doesn't work the way you think, or you have what's referred to as a corner case where it works 99% of the time, but that one case doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Or, there's codependency and you have like five variables in the algorithm. And if all five behave a particular way, then there may be something that happens. And it's hard to guess those. We just have to understand Google is an evolving uh, piece of software for the most part. And their entire goal is to present trusted, valuable, accurate information to consumers on the result of a query. Mm -hmm to a level where people will click on an ad. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's the fundamentally, uh, you know, ask your audience, everybody out there, raise your hand if you believe that Google's in the business of making money. They're not. Raise the, your hand absolutely. if you're in the business of making money. <laughs> exactly, yeah, there we go. And, and quite frankly, I think that people who make money don't deliberately hurt their own reputation. You don't crap in your own nest. I mean, for, <laughs> forgive my expression, but that's the thing is that they're not going to deliberately alienate, could be arg argued, half of their audience 
for a political agenda where where they're going to lose half of their revenue by doing so. And we were talking about this before the show, and, and, and right before the show, Bruce, you and I were talking, is that they're in the business of developing trust of the engine. That's the core concept that they're constantly striving for. So if they're if, if they're screwing that up, then they have to have their own governance internally uh, if they are doing that. I mean, they... The article even referred to what what Google has done. They've hired two main political advocates, one on the left, one on the right, to field complaints from these different these different leaning politically leaning groups to field any type of complaints. It's not one way; it's two ways. So they they're in the business of understanding what's happening in these spaces, and the article does make a lot of assertions towards political bias outside influencer bias and and the utilization of, of blacklists that's all subject to perspective and you're talking about the core principle of this company any company they got to make money why would they do that right i think that one of the things we should also pay attention to uh in the area of trust is let's suppose i'm a medic site and we know there was an update sure. in august of 18. yep I am trusted. I am a doctor. I am a leader in my industry. I teach at all the universities. I am a leader. But somehow in my website, which was built by somebody who works for me, who's not a doctor, mm -hmm. and somehow they said, hey, you know, we can make money running ads on our website. And they put an ad on the side of the page that happens to be paid for by somebody not quite so trustworthy. Right suddenly that biases my site as being not trustworthy. A direct association. Direct association. You, you're gonna play in the mud, you're gonna get dirty. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I think that a lot of people never understood that. They don't understand that I have to behave in a trusted way in order to be trusted. They think that I'm trusted, therefore I'm trusted, not I'm untrusted because of what I do. So there's a lot of, Trust is a difficult thing to understand sometimes. And trust isn't on page. Expertise is on page. Trust isn't authority. That's whether other people who are trusted hmm. think you're trusted. Right. Trust is where the entire consumer industry behaves as if you're not trusted. You know, bad reviews. Um, or where it's uh, far more complicated would be uh, I link out in that neighborhood I link to is untrusted. Mm -hmm. there, there's different things that are trust signals. And I think that Google cannot give untrusted answers. And especially in voice search where they're only going to give one answer, that one answer better be trusted. And I think we see as an industry that SEO is actually extending itself now into, uh, am I actually building something I'm part of that. Mm -hmm. I, am I building something that is actually uh, reputable and, and, and expert information and other uh, authorities in my field agree with me and I can actually do something that I'm proud of? Yep. And if I can't do that, if all I did was build a website and expect to make money, then I'm going to lose. You know, we're in a whole new world. You're absolutely right uh, from an SEO standpoint, and it may not even be considered SEO at that point in time, but I think we're the harbingers of, of or, the, or the torch carriers of this next evolution. It's not marketing. We have to build content that's worthy of value. And, you know, arguably, there's a lot of debate about is Google the best platform? Uh, are they making uh, inroads into defining what truth is? But that's not even the, the space. We as digital consumers are now savvy to what's untrustworthy. And the, the SEOs, the developers of content, now have to create content that's worthy of linking, that's not just transactional content, it's not buyer's journey content. It's got to be valuable in the ecosystem. And boy, that will be a, a separating of the, the wheat from the chaff when it comes down to marketers who can't get that concept. This is digital PR. This is looking for citations and value. This is the era of EAT, expertise, authority, and trust. We, we've, we've got to embrace that, and that's exactly what Google's going after as well. I think that if you look at uh, where all this plays together, 
uh, Google is, is struggling, as any very large company would, with very, very large teams mm -hmm. that are contributing pieces to an algorithm that is highly complex uh, from the standpoint of just the data elements. And then you have to layer on top of it the biases by location. Uh, you have to understand uh, whether or not the intent is this or the intent is that. Right. If there's a trillion keywords. It is entirely possible that there's a trillion algorithms because every intent is different. Every location is different. Uh, and web history mm -hmm. totally changes it because my web history is different from yours. Every keyword I query is a different keyword from everybody else on the planet. That's right. And that's how many algorithms there are. Are you saying with and, our, we're all individual snowflakes with our keywords? Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. That's a good way to put it. But that's what we are. I don't like how I put that. <laughs> uh, all right. So I, I, I got a, a couple key questions regarding. That. I think I think we're on the same page here from a from understanding intent and that the engine is looking to be able to discern that to better the consumer's journey. They're never gonna, they're never gonna screw that up. And that, that's, that's their bread and butter. Um, truth in SEO and truth in, in communication about this. The other side of the coin is that Wall Street Journal rolled out this article. What's the responsibility of journalists to know what the heck they're talking about when it comes down to search engine optimization explicitly? What and they should certainly should be paying attention, but what would you expect them to to? I mean, because it was a very sizable article. What would you expect them to know? Well, I know people. <laughs> uh, I, it would seem to me that the very first thing they should have done is gone to their SEO team and said, "What do you think?" Uh, because <laughs> I don't think their SEO team would have agreed with the article either. <laughs> Uh, and obviously the SEO team is probably in a position where they can't voice uh, their opinion now sure. uh, to the world. But uh, my opinion is somebody should have asked an SEO. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's just obvious what they should have done. Mm -hmm. I think overall that a big part of what we care about as SEOs is that it actually works the way we say it works. And, I don't believe that with some of the subtleties of wording, uh, anybody can make anybody look terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I came in second year next to last. I can make anybody look bad. And to make a search engine that is spending billions of dollars to try to give us the best answers mm -hmm. when nobody else can do it on the planet isn't evil. No. No, no. I think I, that I, I I have nothing but praise for Google. Uh, don't tell them I said that. But <laughs> oh, they know. <laughs> yeah. Well, quite frankly, I, and I'm not a pro Google or against Google or you know, it's it's a uh, instrument that is trying to be the best it can be. And as SEOs, I'm trying to make my client websites the best they can be uh, to outcompete everybody else. Uh, you can't beat the Google algorithm, but you can beat your competition. Yeah. And so I'm doing that. That's what I do for a living. But I really appreciate Google. And I think that if we as an industry uh, buy into the fact that somebody who for sensationalism wanted to say things about Google that were negative, that most of the SEOs, by the way, I think read that mm -hmm. and know. Yeah. I think most of the rest of the people who have no clue read that and say, oh, Google's evil. Well, and that but, was my point. And the, 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 my next point was going to be the role of the politicians that actually set up regulation. They're being informed by this article. And they're making, they're literally making policy by this information. And, and you know, what are the roles and the responsibilities of the, of the politicians? They've got to know, they've, they've got to understand um, if they if they carve into this industry and try to put governors and regulations on that, they're they're destroying the evolution of 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 uh, digital knowledge in, to to a great degree, right? Right. Uh, and and it's entirely possible. F uh, lately, they've been demanding access to the algorithm. Right. 
Well, that's that's Google's property. Uh, I don't I don't see how that could be public domain. Um, and there's and if Google chooses, quite frankly, I think if Google chose to promote one side over the other mm -hmm. in their own property, um, I'm not sure that it's unreasonable to expect that. That it was beat on Google that Google properties outrank other properties. Well fine, then we ought to stop linking to Google properties because we made that happen. <laughs> That's right. You know, if Google is the right answer, you can't blame Google for being the right answer. No, but you, I think that's, I think we have a lot of politicians that don't understand, uh, you know, laws are written for the masses and uh, they'll hear one thing and say, oh, you know, it's illegal right now for you to ask uh, people you pay to help you improve the quality of your product. Not gonna happen. Nope. <laughs> but that's what politicians hear when they read this article. No, you're absolutely right. Well, uh, this, that is a great perspective on the Wall Street Journal article and we certainly uh, recommend anybody who uh, is interested in that and wants to, wants to dive into that, take it with a grain of salt and check with your local SEO. I love that. <laughs> I love the concept because um, you can go through every one of those paragraphs and be able to understand there's a grain of something that they're working on, but literally it was a turn of the knife each and every time, and there's got to be an agenda there. And hey, by the way, if you haven't looked recently, Wall Street Journal lost a heck of a lot of traffic over the last three to four years in their space. I'm not saying that there's any agenda there, but... Anyway, look, they had like 46 million uh, projected searches five years ago, and they're down to eight. So, hey, who knows? Uh, it may uh, kind of walk in, in that space. But um, the last thing is the responsibility of the SEOs. We have a job, don't we? To not just talk amongst ourselves and bitch and moan and what have you, but literally communicate to those who are the purveyors of information because the, the, the rest of them, right, don't know any different in the S from SEO as opposed to content restriction and black hatting. So it's our, it's our job to debunk this, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but I don't think that publications uh, understand the consequence of ignoring us. They, as you said, they're losing traffic, but that isn't, they don't understand that SEO is a savior they perceive SEO as a topic that they could beat up on and therefore th that sensationalism is going to generate the traffic. Well, coming Why home, don't they yeah. just do it better? <laughs> right. Um, and for this particular article, I'll go back to the fact that, you know, as soon as it came out, I heard about it. I went to get it. I went to the wall street journal site. The very first thing I saw was a paywall. <laughs> right. Yep. And you know, I could read the first paragraph and then it turned to gray and then I had to subscribe to get it. Uh, and I don't care to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal because I did what everybody else did. I then went to Google and searched for it and found 47 <laughs> other clear copies of it. So, you know, it isn't like it was a problem. Nope. But, uh, you know, if you're going to be searching for the article, uh, you know, it's, it's no wonder that the Wall Street Journal isn't going to get even the traffic for their own articles when <laughs> well, they're blocking it, the users. Know. Absolutely. Right. They're doing the opposite of what Google's trying to do, make it more user-friendly, make more intuitive information for you, the consumer. And the Wall Street Journal is literally blocking you as soon as it sees that you're interested in that article. That's the dichotomy right there. Literally, it, it couldn't be mo more polar. So, all right. So let's let's uh, drop wall street journal you certainly want to have a look at that look at barrier sports's content we're certainly going to give some uh, great uh, links over to bruce clay and his and his team it's really about about i mean making sure you understand perspective when it comes down to to this space because that can be skewed so many different ways um hey bruce it's been a fantastic time talking to you today we ask a couple questions at the end of every show um to our guests what really bugs you about your industry right now that so many people seem to think it's a commodity oh. that the industry has gotten harder to really far more competitive the algorithms are changing eight times a day 
uh, you have websites that are five years old and we're trying to help the business make money and it it the complexity of that is not being appreciated they they kind of i keep getting people who say well can't i push the easy button and rank number one uh i still get people who say well i did seo it's done you know one of my favorite sayings is seo is done when google stops changing things and all your competition dies (laughs) <laughs> Until then, I think we're in the SEO business. Absolutely. So conversely, and, what excites you about your industry right now? Oh, I love solving puzzles. What I get to do, okay, I'm going to kind of say it yeah. and you can figure it out. What I get to do for a living is juggle Rubik's cubes, trying to solve them in midair while the colors are changing. <laughs> right? Yep. Now, what I actually do by doing that is I am in the ultimate business simulation game. And most people don't recognize what that means. It means that I am making changes to your website. And if I mess up, you could be out of business. Mm-hmm. I am competing against your competition using your website, using your expertise to help us win in a very, very competitive sport, but it's real-time business simulations. I make a change, there's an impact. They make a change, there's an impact. Mm -hmm. And that is a highly competitive, never-ending, 24-7 game, and it is probably one of the most exciting things anybody could ever get into. Amen to that, brother. That's a fantastic analogy. And, you know, you're, you're one that's not taking all the colors off of the cubes and putting them on, on one side, too. That was, that was the old game. Um, oh, in the beginning, everybody just stood there and spray-painted them in midair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, Bruce. What does what, it mean if I use a screwdriver? A screwdriver to pry? Bust the pieces apart. <laughs> Nope, nope. I get, I get the analogy. That's fun. And, but it is absolutely uh, a very, very consequential scenario. And we take our jobs very, very seriously. So I appreciate you stating it that way. Uh, is there anything that we can promote for you? Oh, oh, well, hold on a second. We just want to make sure our users understand that, uh, know that you have a WordPress plugin, the Bruce Clay Word, uh, WordPress plugin that is a fantastic tool. So tell us about that real quick. Sure. We wrote... Uh, we had tools for a long time that were like any other kind of tool. They ran software as a service, mm-hmm. ranking monitors, link analyzers, page analyzers, lots of things. Right. We rebuilt it with an API layer, and then we built a layer inside of WordPress that gave unique data. Uh, for instance, everybody says, well, I'm running Yoast, therefore I have my SEO tool. Well, Yoast is only like 10% of what we do. And if you have Yoast, we're compatible. We just turn off that part in our tool. Hmm. But one of the things I discovered over time is that for every one SEO, there's probably 50 to 100 writers. There's 54 million posts done every month. Oh, geez. And that is not something SEO as an industry, everybody as an industry can keep up with. Nope. The only way to really win at SEO is to have it built in. So our plugin was really trying to bring important parts of SEO to the writing community so that they could out-compete their other writers. If you want to, if you want to win, you know, an example of that is work smarter when you build the content, not build content and then give it to some other team in the building that does SEO and hope that they can, you know, tweak it enough to make it work. You build it in. So a lot of our tools are designed for writers. And I think that that's going to be the the substantial change. Yeah, that's the only way to keep up with it. You're absolutely right. How many? 54 million pieces of, of, of content? Every month. Oh, my Lord. Okay. That's just daunting. And by the way, while you said there were 54 million pieces of content written every month. Yep. There were 216 more written. <laughs> Don't do that. Stop it. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, is there anything else that we can promote for you today? 
Well, you know, we do expert services. That's what we do. Happy to, uh, we do audits, we do penalty reviews, we do retainers, we do uh, blocks of ask us anything. I mean, we do a lot of different kinds of services. So if somebody has a need, at least understand we're here. Absolutely. So go check out BruceClay.com. You can certainly tra- track down Bruce on LinkedIn at Bruce Clay. Uh, Twitter, Bruce Clay Inc. Uh, Facebook, Bruce Clay Inc. Any final thoughts for uh, our SEO audience, both young and old? Um, key thoughts about uh, going forward in SEO? Well, a lot of people are relying on tools, mm-hmm. just tools. And we need to understand tools are going to give you all the data you need but there is a difference between data and wisdom. And if you don't have the wisdom to implement it, uh, it's just a bunch of data. You know, so we've seen people who have looked at data uh, from analytics or search console or things like that. And they're like deer in the headlights. Mm-hmm. They glaze over, they don't know what to do with it. They say, great, that's a nice number, pretty graph, thank you. <laughs> and they don't have a clue what it's telling them. So I think the, the message for SEOs is that we just have to understand what to do with the data and start applying the wisdom to actually be competitive in the market. Very good, sir. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. It's been a long time want for me to have you on the show. Would you be game for a rematch and coming back on the show sometime in, the, in 2020? Sure. Excellent. Uh, it's pretty easy. Excellent. Excellent. Try you, to make you it. You hardly easy. ever beat me up, even. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm kind of a kind of a I'm kind of kind of a fan, a fanboy of, of Bruce Clay, so <laughs> I, I wouldn't touch it. All right, so Bruce, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for our audience actually uh, joining us in 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 our iTunes space as well as our live space uh, on on YouTube. So check us out there regularly. Don't forget to like and subscribe uh, to the Edge of the Web on YouTube. And if you're really feeling up to it, up to it day, today, drop us a quick review on iTunes as well because we need your help uh, to make sure that we're buoyant and in, in optimized to the best degree. Let us know how we're doing. Be sure to sign up for the Edge newsletter over at edgeofthewebradio.com. You can sign up right there or Text to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk, and sign up right there. We're sending over great snippets of uh, uh, great information about the show, who we're going to be interviewing, and our takes on the news. So go over there as much as you as you can and refer people to the, sh- to the newsletter as well. Check out all the recent videos and much more over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. We'll talk to you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye.